Uh, so, hey everyone, uh, I'm Nico. I'm going to be doing the talk from zero to red team. We're going to be talking about uh, what a red team is and when we need one and when I should put my computer on do not disturb. There we go. Uh, so, the first thing uh, we'll talk about. Oh, hold on. And let me share my screen. That's probably a good one. All right, can you guys see the presentation? Yes? Yep. Okay, okay great. All right, so a little about me before we get started. Uh, Nico, my name is Nico. I'm on the red team at Deloitte. I'm based in San Diego, California. Uh, before coming to Deloitte, I worked at several companies, Accenture, PwC, ResMed, and Active Network. I'm also an adjunct professor specializing in uh, ethical hacking and information assurance at several universities here in San Diego. I got my undergraduate degree in political science from UC San Diego and my grad degree in information security from the University of London. As anybody who knows me will tell you, I hate coffee and I much prefer Red Bull. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Nico Behar, and then uh, my LinkedIn addresses at the bottom of the slide here. So first thing we need to do is we need to map the attack surface. And so in order to do that, we need to understand what our assets are. So in today's day and age, assets can come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. So as shown in the beautiful stock photograph here, we have phones, uh, laptops, mice, we can have IoT devices, we can have operational technology devices, medical devices, we can have ICS devices, uh, anything really with an operating system or a network connection uh, can be considered an asset. And we, first thing we have to do before we actually go and form a red team or commission a red team is we have to uh, determine our assets. So first type of asset we're going to look at are hardware assets. Uh, so there's a few different types. Uh, we have endpoints and in that category we have laptops, desktops, uh, and terminals. Then we also have servers. In that category we have file servers, databases, and hypervisors among others. Then we have network devices, which include routers, switches, access points, firewalls, and hubs. We also have uh, mobile assets, so smartphones, tablets, and points of sale. And then operational technology and IoT, so any network-enabled devices, any ICS devices, any sensors, any medical devices. And we want to collect certain data points from our hardware assets. So we'll want to collect the serial number, we'll want to collect the model number, we'll want to look at the manufacturer, we'll want to look at the warranty and the hardware specifications. This is important because different hardware types uh, can have unique vulnerabilities like firmware vulnerabilities, architecture vulnerabilities, and hardware vulnerabilities. Next, we want to look at software assets. So there's several different types of software that we want to look at. First, we'll want to look at operating systems. So for example, Unix, Linux, Microsoft, Mac, Android, iOS, among others. Then we have productivity software. So we're talking about word processors, spreadsheet software, slide deck software, any email clients, any calendar software, Another type of software is a driver, and that's a piece of software that allows the operating system to interact with uh, the hardware on the host. Then we have other third-party software, so uh, video editing software, CAD software, uh, visual design software, any data visualization software, any IDEs, uh, etc. So what kind of data do we want to collect about uh, these assets? Well, we want to collect first the application name, then the version number, who's the vendor of the application, is the application uh, supported, right? So a little side story here, I was recently at a client uh, and they were running uh, a patching system that 
was not supported for the past three years and could not patch uh, Windows 10. So it's very important to find out if the software that you're running is supported and updates are still provided for it. We also want to look at any dependencies. Uh, so maybe it has uh, some library, the software will have some libraries that it runs on or some codecs that need to be installed. So we want to make sure we're looking at those as well. And then the reason uh, that this matters is because different applications can introduce various vulnerabilities in different parts uh, of the application or the underlying libraries, runtimes, or dependencies. And those are all uh, that are those the two different types. And now let's put it together. So now we can see which vulnerabilities are in the environment. So the hardware asset information will help monitor for vulnerabilities that affect the hardware and equipment in the environment. The software asset information is going to help monitor for vulnerabilities that affect applications running in the environment. So now we can look at vendor advisories to see if there's any vulnerabilities that have been uh, disclosed. We can do the same with mailing lists. Uh, we can look at community forums and discussion boards, and we can look at any update feeds uh, from any of our security products that we have. So this matters because monitoring uh, the environment and the appropriate information sources allows for identification and analysis of new vulnerabilities that are present in the environment. And it's step zero on our journey to a red team. All right, so now we'll look at uh, the next step, which is vulnerability management. So some objectives and activities. We're going to scan assets for vulnerabilities and misconfigurations. So we can do this uh, with a commercial solution like Nessus, or we can use uh, an open source solution like OpenVAS, or we can build our own solution. We want to make sure that we're monitoring and analyzing threats and vulnerabilities reported in real time uh, to respond to security incidents. Right, so we want to look at any threats, new threats and new vulnerabilities uh, that are being released through whatever mechanisms we're using to get those, whether that be uh, a threat intelligence feed or through a community intelligence sharing network. Uh, we want to make sure that we're using that information uh, to respond to security incidents that may present themselves in our environment. We want to make sure that we're maintaining uh, our scanning tools and we're reviewing the latest uh, rules and uh, configurations that are to be used. We wanna make sure that they line up with our environment and that they're not going to take anything down. We also want to use the software asset information uh, to help monitor for vulnerabilities that affect applications that are running in our environment. So we're doing this, but how do we actually determine uh, if we're performing as we should be? Well, first thing we want to do is we want to consider the risk and prioritize the activity. So this is very important because every organization is different. So every organization's risk is going to be different. So they're going to be measuring uh, differently and they're going to be looking at different vulnerabilities because every organization has different unique risks that are posed to them. Uh, and so they should approach that appropriately. After we've considered the risk and prioritized the activity, we can also look at uh, the percentage of organizationally deemed critical systems scanned per quarter. So of the systems that are the most important to us, so for example, let's say we have uh, a bottling company, somebody that bottles soda, right? One of their most critical systems would be the system that runs the, the bottling machine, the one that actually uh, files the bottles through the factory and they get filled with the soda, right? So that's going to be a very, that's going to be a critical system. So how many of the systems with that criticality that are very, very important uh, throughout the organization have been examined this quarter? Another metric we can look at to see how we're doing is we can look at the number of vulnerabilities uh, that have been enumerated. We can also look at the percentage of systems with no known uh, severe vulnerabilities. We can look at the percentage of detected vulnerabilities associated with accepted risks or non-technical controls. So what we mean by uh, accepted risks is that sometimes we can get a, if we're not able to patch a vulnerability, we can get a, a risk exception 
and it'll and the risk is then accepted and they will allow us to forego applying or that update or remediating that vulnerability because somebody has accepted the risk. And we can also, another metric, we can look at the percentage of vulnerabilities associated uh, with known patches or fixes and how many, uh, how many of those vulnerabilities have been actually remediated and how many are still in the environment waiting to be remediated with a patch available. So the reason that vulnerability management matters is because monitoring our environment and the appropriate information sources will allow us to efficiently identify and address new vulnerabilities that are present in our environment. And this is gonna be considered step one on our journey uh, to a red team. All right, so next we have uh, penetration testing. And this is where we're actually going to exploit the vulnerabilities. So oftentimes uh, it can start out with uh, a set of formal documents, right? So for example, it could have a statement of work and a rules of engagement. And the rules of engagement is going to say what we can and cannot do. So we'll oftentimes refer to the rules of engagement document to see if something's in scope. So before we start a penetration test, uh, we're going to look at all the systems. We're going to sit down with the client and we're going to determine a scope and we're going to determine the rules of engagement. So they can say, okay, you can only test between, uh, one time I had it where it was, you can only test between 4 p.m and 2 a.m. So you have to be on site only between 4 p.m. and 2 a.m., right? And so if that's what the rules of engagement say, then that's the time that you're gonna be testing. Penetration tests also allow uh, an organization to discover potential weaknesses in their environment because the key difference here between a penetration test and a vulnerability assessment is that in a penetration test, we're actually exploiting the vulnerability. Whereas in a vulnerability assessment, we're just checking to see if the vulnerability is present. Now, that's not to say that we could potentially exploit it there, but the key difference between a penetration test and a vulnerability assessment is the active exploitation of vulnerabilities. And so this gives us an opportunity to test our security controls. Are the controls that are looking for exploitation going to detect that exploitation or are they going to fail and not be able to detect that exploitation? The penetration test is ideally going to be a black box test uh, that ideally would be performed by a third party in order to get an independent perspective. And it can oftentimes be compliance driven. Uh, as we know, a lot of regulations like HIPAA, SOX, um, among others, they require uh, penetration tests to be carried out uh, I think uh, every year or multiple times per year, depending on the regulation. Uh, and the security teams are oftentimes going to know that the penetration test is going on. So how do we measure our performance in, when we're conducting penetration tests? How do we know that they're helping our organization become more secure? Well, how many vulnerabilities uh, have we picked up, right? Did we pick up all the uh, vulnerabilities that were picked up in the vulnerability assessment phase? Are we able to identify the main root cause um, that can address a lot of the findings that the penetration test has brought to light? So if we have a lot of misconfiguration, do we know why everything's misconfigured? Are we able to address that so we can fix it? If we have something that's not updated, do we know why it's not updated? Are we gonna be able to uh, identify the root cause and then go and fix it? And so the reason that penetration testing matters is because uh, monitoring it and testing it is actually going to allow us to see if we can test our controls and see if we can actually exploit the vulnerabilities. And it's step two on our journey to the red team. So now let's get to red team uh, operations. And one of the main goals of red team operations is to look at the organizational blind spots. So we're going to assess the effectiveness of the organization's cybersecurity program from a holistic standpoint to include the monitoring and response capabilities. So the testing is performed via tailored scenarios, looking at an organization as a sum of its parts. So we're taking into account physical, human, and cyber, as well as from the point of view of a determined attacker. 
So these are oftentimes uh, the different aspects that we're going to look at when we're doing a red team engagement, right? So we can look at physical uh, entry, uh, we can look at physical access mechanisms, access control mechanisms. We're also definitely going to look at the human element, right? And uh, a lot of the times we're going to engage in phishing. All right, so I promised pretty pictures. So here come the pic pretty pictures. All right, so the bottom line uh, with red teaming, right? So real quick, some points of reference based on our client experience. So six days is the average time to achieve uh, a set objective after the reconnaissance phase. 94% of our clients were successfully compromised uh, during the red teaming engagement. 70% of our clients had very limited capabilities in detecting or responding to the breach of their system and their crown jewels. And one day is on average the time to compromise uh, the first device and gain initial access to the client's network after the reconnaissance phase. So when we talk about adversarial simulation or red teaming, uh, we're talking about a realistic approach to security testing, right? Because we're emulating our adversaries. So it's going to enable an organization to assess their overall readiness, resiliency, and awareness using realistic scenario-based controlled events. Adversarial simulations offerings go above and beyond vulnerability assessments and penetration testing as it incorporates all components within the organization in scope and has a realistic scenario-based approach. But ultimately, red team operations allow organizations to mature their cyber capabilities and kickstart transformation programs. So as we talked about on the last slide, there's three core elements that we consider when we're doing uh, red teaming. So the first thing we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at physical. So we're gonna look at your buildings. We're gonna look at your desks. We're gonna look at uh, the safes, right? And we're gonna look at any physical IT infrastructure. The amount of passwords that I have found uh, on people's desks, uh, I've lost track. People leaving uh, their drawers unlocked, right? A whole bunch of stuff going on uh, in the physical element. Then we have uh, the human element. Right, so that represents the employees or customers, the clients or third parties um, that uh, bind the cyber and the physical world together. Right, so people will oftentimes hold the door open for you, or uh, if you ask them questions, they will give you the answer, even if they're not supposed to. Right, then we have uh, cyber that represents the online world, the internet, as well as uh, corporate internets. Right, uh, any cloud services, right? And all other computer networks and devices. So some use cases for adversary simulation, right? So the first example we can look at is source code exfiltration. So somebody might bring in a red team to do source code exfiltration. So they can test from both uh, a trusted insider and an external threat agent perspective, right? So we're going to do, uh, so for example, we could do reconnaissance uh, and find the exposed repository, uh, or we could find it on the internet. Uh, then after that, we could exfiltrate the code. We could also test developer workstations uh, and, develop, and deployment workflows like Jenkins uh, to create target packages for spear phishing uh, developers, right? We could, we could exfiltrate through physical means uh, such as USB. Another use case would be customer data exfiltration. We could identify uh, where the technology stores customer data, so, uh, where the website and CRM, the databases, the workstations, uh, the software as a service uh, applications and the client services data is stored. Then we can test uh, different exfiltration vectors, uh, both overt and covert, depending uh, on what we find during the reconnaissance phase. And we can also uh, leverage targeting data supplied uh, by our reconnaissance phase to attack eternally facing uh, weaknesses and misconfigurations. We could also go after a manufacturing and logistics system. First, we would identify critical manufacturing and logistics systems. 
Then we would conduct physical and wireless security testing at manufacturing plants. Then we would test system segmentation, move laterally throughout uh, the network. And then we would test any hardware uh, and firmware uh, and maybe do some source code review. We can also look at uh, remote update mechanisms for customer systems, right? So we've done a few of those. We can test uh, the authentication mechanisms and we can see if we can bypass them. We can test the impact of an insider threat to clients. So this is one uh, that I was lucky enough to have just done. Unfortunately, it was canceled, uh, but we were doing an insider threat emulation uh, at a client where we had to break out of a Citrix environment. Uh, we were successful until the coronavirus came along. Uh, also, code signing service is another example. Uh, so the first thing we would try to do is identify key individuals in appropriate business units and craft targeted spear phishing emails. After they've clicked the link, uh, hopefully, we're going to elevate access uh, to the point that it's possible to sign malicious code. And the final use case uh, is uh, product or technology testing. So one example would be testing the data synchronization mechanisms and the protocol between the company network and their air-gapped recovery system. We could also test the recovery procedure and verify the integrity and the recovery system can't uh, be affected when performing uh, those procedures. So some benefits of adversarial simulation or red teaming. Uh, well, we're gonna have extensive technology coverage, right? So we're gonna test the traditional uh, attack surface, right? So network, application, and wireless. Uh, but then we're also going to look at more non-traditional uh, technologies like ICS, SCADA. We can do cloud. We can do mobile. We're definitely going to incorporate threat intelligence. Uh, we're going to use multiple threat intelligence sources to provide uh, insight based on threat sources. So we're going to emulate the threats that may actually pertain to you. So if you're doing business in China or if your business is heavily reliant on China, we could choose to emulate the TTPs of known Chinese actors. Uh, we can test uh, the process effectiveness, not just uh, the technical symptoms, right? So since we have a much larger scope, we can actually go uh, and test the entire process, right? And we can tie it back to uh, a cybersecurity process. We can recognize that threats don't respect boundaries, right? Because during, remember I talked about the penetration test, we had the rules of engagement. Uh, we do have rules uh, when we're doing red team operations, uh, but they're not, there aren't as many rules. Um, so we can more closely emulate a real world adversary uh, by reducing the amount of boundaries that we have to subject ourselves to. We're also going to address the human factor of cybersecurity, right? A lot of penetration tests and vulnerability assessments aren't going to assess the human factor, but in Red Team Operations, Advanced Adversary Simulation, we're making sure to address the human factor of cybersecurity. Um, we're going to do social engineering, we're going to do insider threat, uh, and we're going to do phishing. We can also look at automation and integration between tools. We can look at the alignment um, to actual emerging cyber threats, not just uh, compliance requirements. So we'll make sure that we're testing, uh, we're testing systems based on threats that could actually be posed to them. We're not just going through and doing the OWASP top 10 or the CIS top 20. We're actually going to look at the environment and see what is possible in the environment and try to craft uh, something that is unique and would successfully result in accomplishing one of our objectives. Also, we can provide business awareness and insight um, because we're going above and beyond the typical penetration test, we're getting to know the different business processes, the different functions, uh, and therefore we can test um, the integration between business and IT. All right, so I promised maturity model, so here we go. Um, so adversarial simulation uh, uses multiple testing techniques to achieve value. So we're gonna focus on performing realistic cyber threat-based testing activities with actionable and value-added results, 
and resulting in improvements to the client's capabilities to protect against, detect, and respond to cyber attacks. So here is the uh, red team uh, maturity uh, model. So on the bottom, on the x-axis, we have, as we slide to the right, uh, the organizational maturity and the capability to action on results that they get from uh, one of the three steps is going to increase. On the y-axis, uh, as we move up the y-axis, uh, the analysis and complexity of uh, the test and the environment are, are going to go up. So we can see in the first step, we have vulnerability assessment. So here, before we move to the next step, uh, we wanna make sure we're doing automated vulnerability scans, that we have configuration analysis. So we're making sure everything's configured correctly uh, and it stays configured correctly. We wanna make sure we're integrated with security operations. So everything that we're doing in, a vul in the vulnerability assessment phase and looking at uh, configuration management, doing all of that should be integrated with security operations. We should also be conducting code analysis if we're writing any software. And in addition, we should be manually verifying our, the existence of our vulnerabilities. Then once we move to step two, we should be performing uh, manual exploitation analysis, right? We should be validating the existence of our exploits. If we have wireless networks, we should be engaging in wireless security assessments. We should be beginning to venture down the path of physical and social attack vectors. We should also be looking at business risk integration in the second phase. And we should also be testing our detection and response. Now, once we move into advanced adversary simulation or red team operations, those are going to be tailored threat driven testing for your organization. We're going to integrate in the cyber human and physical aspects of information security. And we're going to have multiple feedback mechanisms and integrations with key stakeholders to make sure to keep them in the loop and to demonstrate that we're adding value. We're also going to perform deep exploitation and exfiltration analysis. Now, when we're ready for a red team, we're going to have scenario-based analysis, right? So one of the things that sets red teaming apart is that it's scenario-based. So somebody can say, hey, okay, let's say a soda company comes and hires you. The soda company is not gonna come and tell you, hey, go get domain admin. They're gonna tell you, okay, go steal the secret formula for uh, secret soda pop and also uh, turn the bottling machine off without anybody noticing. So they'll give, they'll give uh, objective and scenario based. Uh, that's, how the, that's how the results are based. We wanna have uh, objective and scenario based outcomes. We're also going to start involving our blue team once we get into the uh, red team operations uh, maturity level. We're going to want to, as I said before, engage in threat actor profiling and emulation. So if your business, if your business or your organization has a lot of exposure to Russia, then we could be uh, asked to emulate uh, a Russian APT. Uh, we're also going to do exfiltration analysis. We're going to see if you're going to catch us stealing your stuff. So if you're able to see us stealing your stuff, then great. And then if not, that's something that uh, is going to be uh, worked on during uh, this phase of maturity, right? That's something we're going to be working on since we already have all of the other stuff in the other two phases, like vulnerability scans, um, basic physical and social attacks, um, exploiting vulnerabilities. That's all in previous phases. Uh, we want to be engaging in cyber war games. We want to make sure, and we also want to make sure that we have uh, consistent and sustained operations. That is the highest level of maturity when we're doing all of this uh, consistent in a consistent and sustained uh, fashion. So that's it. Uh, if you guys have questions, I can take a few uh, I don't know if we have time to do it here or I can just do it in the Slack. Uh, go ahead and take a question. You actually, I mean, we're behind, but you actually kind of kicked us back in. Let's oh, see. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, 
can't see anything, but if you want to go into Slack um, Connect, the Track Connect, um, see if there's, oh, somebody asked if you were sharing your slides. Um, and I don't think they meant like during the talk, I think maybe after. Um, so you can. Yeah, you can reach out to me and, and uh, I'll, I'll let you know where you can get a copy. They'll be distributed okay. eventually. All right, cool. Well, Nico, we appreciate your time today. I know you got up early. Um, so thanks for doing that. And uh, hopefully next time this will all be in person. Yep. Thanks. Thank you.